다음 두 번째 발표로 넘어가겠습니다. 두 번째 발표는 이갈 아르년 앤 코의 엘라이 그린바움 변호사님께서 오픈소스 소프트웨어 라이선스 해석에 대한 이해를 주제로 발표를 해 주시겠습니다. 연사님을 여러분의 환영의 박수와 함께 모시겠습니다. Hi, it's really an honor, really an honor and a pleasure to be invited to give this presentation at the public domain and open source software license conference in t I've always wanted to come visit Seoul, um, and this year was no exception. But unfortunately, due to COVID restrictions, I'm unable to join you personally. I hope that in the future, um, I will have the opportunity to come and visit your beautiful city. Uh, my name is Eli Greenbaum. I'm a lawyer located in Jerusalem, Israel. And I'm very much embedded in the high-tech ecosystem here located in Israel. Today, I'd like to give a short presentation about open source interpretation. So open source interpretation, or the interpretation of free and open source software licenses, is a topic that's always in the background of discussions and controversies concerning open source licenses. Every discussion about them assumes some uh, assumptions about how those licenses should be interpreted or what forms of authority or evidence should be taken and brought to bear on the interpretation of those licenses. But we rarely talk about this topic exp explicitly. It's rarely a topic that's brought into the foreground. And I'd like to take this opportunity to talk for a few moments and give some thoughts about how we can approach this important topic. So. First, I'd like to start off with an example, a short example. And I'll take this example from the text of the general public license, version two of that license. Uh, this is not uh, an example that we talk about very frequently, but it's an example that has been the subject of, very, of some frequent controversies and discussions in the literature and in journals regarding free and open source software. So I think it's very germane to talk about this example. The example is taken from the text of the general public license, version two of that license. And as many of you know, the general public license is a free and open source software license that imposes some obligations on, on the users of that license. So just to give a very short example, if I am using some software pursuant to the general public license and I want to distribute that software to third parties, I can't just give those third parties the executable code of that software, I must also give them, according to the terms of the general public license, I must also give them the source code of that license. And the general public license provides a short definition of what we mean when we say that I must provide the third party the source code of that license. So in section three of version two of the license, the general public license provides that complete source code means all the source code for all the modules, so all of the source code basically, plus any associated interface definition files. That's not the very clearest language that I can imagine, but that's what it says. We'll skip that for a second. Plus the scripts used to control compilation and installation of the executable. And the language that we'll focus on is plus the scripts used to control installation of the executable. So does this language mean as some commentators have contended that when I provide source code as required by the terms of the general public license, that I also have to provide a means to the users, to the recipients of those source codes to reinstall the source code that I'm providing to them. So for example, if I'm providing to my users uh, a hardware device that includes source code from the general public license, do I just have to provide them that source code and say, well, thank you, users. You can go find another hardware device and install any, you can change that code, and, but you must find another hardware device in order to install any modified version of the software. Or must I actually give them, my users, the opportunity to install any modified version of the source code that they may create on the same hardware device? Do I actually have to allow them to change the software on the hardware device that I've provided? And some have contended that this language, which says scripts used to control installation of the executable, means that I must provide my users with the opportunity to install any modified version of the software on any hardware that I may provide. 
Um, in other words, I must so, for example, if the hardware is protected by some cryptographic key, then I must allow my users access to the cryptographic key so that they can reinstall any modified version of the software on that hardware. That's at least the contention of some commentators. And other commentators oppose that language and say, no, 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 that's not what the language means at all. Um, so if we're going to make a decision about what this language means, we have to interpret the license. We have to uh, decide what principles we are going to use to interpret this license and how we are going to decide what this language means. So, interpretation. What, does, what are the principles of interpreting a document, a legal document? Usually, usually courts will say, and obviously this changes and depends on the jurisdiction that we're in. And I'm sure that we have one law what, that courts in New York or Israel or South Korea all take very different approaches. But generally, in my experience, the approaches of courts have been that the goal of interpretation is to determine the intent of the parties. When we interpret a license, we have to determine what the intent of the parties to this license is. If we have a contract, we have to determine what the intent of the parties to the contract is. Um, there are various ways of deciding what that intent can be, looking at the contract, looking at extrinsic evidence, but fundamentally, the goal of, the, of a court or in the goal of interpretation is determining the intent of the parties in entering into this document. So, often, uh, courts use various principles in order to decide what the intent of the parties is. So, and here I'm going to give a very brief summary, and obviously this will differ depending on the exact jurisdiction of the parties. Um, and again, courts in New York or Israel or South Korea may have very different approaches. But generally speaking, when interpreting a document, courts will first look at the intrinsic evidence. What does the document itself say? So, first they will look to the written terms. What does the document say? What is written in this document? If that's not clear enough, or at least if one of the parties claim that that document, that that document itself is not clear enough, then will courts will look to canons of construction. And what that means is the rules of interpretation. There should, can be very specific rules for interpreting documents. For example, singular can also mean plural. Uh, male can also mean female. For example, very simple rules of interpretation. What we mean when uh, there's inclusive language or what we mean when, we, when, there's, when, when language is not inclusive. In other words, fundamental rules of interpretation of the document. And finally, after we've had looked at the written terms and the canons of construction, then courts will obviously use reasonable common sense in trying to understand what that document means. Aside from the document itself, aside from the written document itself, courts will often look to what we consider extrinsic evidence. And extrinsic evidence means fundamentally, basically, evidence that is outside the document itself. So that could include, <clears throat> and, and again, this will differ depending on the jurisdiction of the parties. But that could include the course of performance. How do the parties behave under this contract? Because how the parties behave can give some evidence as to what their intentions were. What is the course of dealing of the parties? How did the parties relate to each other? Not just in the context of this contract, but in the context of their relationship in general. And again, the reason is because if we look at the relationship of the parties, it can give us some idea of what they meant, what their intentions were in the context of any specific agreement. And then courts will often look to a, the usage of trade. What do words mean in the general marketplace, in the trade? Um, courts will often look to that. And then, if none of that is clear, courts will often look to the negotiations of the parties. So at some point, the parties were negotiating between themselves. They may have uh, discussed the language or disputed the language or gone back and forth and changed the language in the contract itself. And what can these negotiations tell us about the intention of the parties? But fundamentally, all of this, the intrinsic evidence and the extrinsic evidence, the language of the document and the language of the parties, 
outside of the doc the, the behavior of the parties outside of the document. Fundamentally, very frequently, the purpose of this entire examination is for a court to determine the intent of the parties. For the court to understand what the parties meant when they entered into this contract. Now, the question is, does this goal determine the intention of the parties also apply in the context of free and open source licenses? If a free and source open license, free and open source software license is interpreted in the same manner as any other legal document, then again, the goal of the courts should often be to determine the intent of the parties. And what this would mean in practice is that there is a licensor, there is a copyright holder, there is some party that wrote the software, the material that's being licensed, and there is a party that's using that software, that material. And if we were to use standard processes of interpretation, then we would say that the goal of the court in trying to determine the language in any document, in including free and source software license, free and, source, free and open source software licenses, should be to understand the intentions of the parties, the intentions of the licensor and the licensee in the context of this transaction. So, if a licensor has made it clear that he is licensing any software under uh, specific terms, then obviously the goal of the court, the court should be to understand what those terms are. Now, I just want to be clear that this is, this is, this, this, the, the process that I've outlined so far is how legal scholars often look at free and source software, open source software licenses, in that they should be, the goal of interpretation should be to determine the intent of the parties. That is not often how community participants uh, approach the question of interpretation of the licenses. If you will just pull someone off the street, who a software developer who's involved in an open source community, and you ask him, how should you interpret the license? Then they will often say, well, we should look to uh, the intentions of the authors of the license, what the, the authors mean. So for example, in the context of the general public license, we should look to the intentions of the Free Software Foundation, what did they mean when they were interpreting the license? What were their intentions in writing the license? What have they written on their website about the license, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't think that that's how most legal scholars would approach the question. Most of them would say, no, the Free Software Foundation is the author of the license. They've put a template license out into the public, out into the community for people to use. But when we actually need to interpret what that license means, the intentions of the Free Software Foundation as the author of the license are less important than what the participants to the licensing transaction actually meant. And if we need to understand what any license means, we need to understand what the intentions of the parties were, what the intentions of the licensor and the licensee to this transaction are. Now, I want to argue um, that this is not the way, this is not the way that we should interpret free and source software, open source software licenses. And the reason is because free and source soft, open source software licenses are really template agreements. They're not an agreement that's negotiated between two parties. They're a template agreement in which that are often and frequently reused between in many multiple kinds of transactions. And there's very few changes to the language in any of these transactions. The two parties to the transaction will simply take the license make minimal, if any, changes to the wording, and simply put it on the software that they want to license. The parties will not negotiate what the, what, what the language of the license is. The one party, will, the licensor, will simply say, listen, my software is being made available under the terms of the general public license, the Apache license, etc." And the other party will accept that. And there will be no negotiation as to the wording of the license or as to the meaning of the license. It will just be a template agreement that's attached to the software and the software is made available in the world according to the terms of that software. Now, open, free and open source software licenses are not the only documents in the world that are like that. There are other documents, for example, ISDA and swap, financial swaps transactions that are, uh, that are those kind of documents. They're template documents that are used over and over and over again in the marketplace with some but minimal changes. And incoterms are another example, and there's lots of different examples. Um, 
trade organizations can often make uh, template documents available uh, for the for the use by 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 their members, and often those template documents are used as template documents with minimal changes. But I think that free and source soft, free and open source software licenses are very much template agreements. For example, frequently the parties, the licensor, will not even put the name of the put, put the text of the license on the software. They'll simply say, "Listen, my software is made available under the terms of this license, under the terms of this template license," and the licensee will know where to find the terms, the language of that template license. But, but there uh, will frequently the, the the parties refer to the li licenses as templates rather than specific language. Indeed, there is often a concern of license proliferation in free and source software open communities. So parties want there to be a limited kind, limited limited amount of software templates. They don't want there to be too many kind of licenses. This concern evidence ev this concern evidences uh, a desire to limit the kind of free and source software open source software licenses to a specific limited number of templates. In other words. The fact that the licenses are templates is important to the community. The community wants to know uh, with minimal, wants to be able to assess the licensing terms of any specific piece of software with minimal investment, minimal investment of resources. And to that effect, it's important to the community that, any, uh, that, that, that the number of licensed templates be kept to a minimum and that parties do not invent their own unique, sui generis, free and open source software licenses, but that, that rather that the parties uh, um, stick with the standard free and source software licenses that we see in, uh, that we see in the wild. Um, free and source, open source licenses are often used between heterogeneous parties, meaning that the licensor can be a very large uh, multinational uh, or it could be a, a single developer. Um, in the same sense, the, the, the party on the other side uh, can be a, a large multinational company or a very small uh, developer. Um, they, they could be in different parts of the supply chain. They could be licensed or they could be intermediate. They could be aggregators of the software. In other words, open source licenses are used throughout the supply chain in different positions of the supply chain with different parties. And none of these parties change or very infrequently change the language of the license. Rather, all the parties, all the various different parties, large, small, whatever jurisdiction, wherever they are located in the supply chain, give reference to the specific template, specific license template that is being used. Um, there is very, very infrequently, very infrequently do the parties actually negotiate. Another, Another principle in open source software licenses, which emphasizes the fact that these are licensed templates, is the principle of non-discrimination. So if uh, you look at what constitutes an open source license and you look to the open source definition of the open source initiative or to the free software definition of the free uh, software foundation, you will see that the principle of non-discrimination plays an important role there. The principle of non-discrimination is basically that any user, any potential user of the software can use that software pursuant to the terms uh, without any discrimination as to why that party is using it, who, if that party, the nationality of that party, the potential use of that party, the location of that party, the gender, the race, the religion of that party, everyone is allowed to use that software. There is no discrimination between parties regarding the use of open source software. This feeds in to the fact that these licenses are templates. If these licenses were negotiated between different parties or even interpreted differently based upon the position of the parties or their nationality or their race or religion or gender, then we would no longer have template licenses. We would have licenses that change depending on the position of the parties. Um, so the fact that this principle of non-discrimination is, is, is an important principle in open source software licenses, again, emphasizes the fact that these licenses are fundamentally template licenses. So again, how does the fact that these are template licenses affect uh, our goals in interpreting uh, a license, interpreting an open source software license? So if typically we had said that the goal of interpreting an open source software license is to determine the intent of the parties, I'm sorry, I misspoke. 
if we said that in normal, in ordinary legal relationships, in ordinary legal contracts, the intent is to determine the intent, the, the goal of interpretation is to determine the intent of the parties, well, that would be a little strange in the context of open source licenses that are templates. Because if we're talking about a template, uh, then the meaning really shouldn't change depending on the specific parties to the transaction. The meaning uh, should stay similar because that's the point of having a template. And indeed, the principles that we talked about before, especially the principle of non-discrimination, emphasizes that the interpretation of these licenses should stay consistent regardless of who the parties to the transaction are, regardless of the intention of the licensor and the licensee. So, it would be a little odd to say that the goal of interpreting open source licenses should be the same goal that we use in ordinary legal relationships, to determine the intent of the parties, because that seems a little strange in the context of template licenses. So, I would like to offer a proposal. Um, and this proposal is based um, on a series of court cases, which I refer to below. Uh, in New York and in the United States, uh, in which the courts have uh, have looked to template licenses, and basically, you know, I'm simplifying a bit, but basically, what they have said is that in template licenses, the goal of interpretation should be basically not to understand the position of the parties, the intention of the specific parties, the intention of the specific licensor and licensee to the transaction, in order to understand the language of the license. Rather, the goal should be to understand the marketplace. What does the marketplace think of the license? How does the marketplace interpret the license? How does the community uh, interpret and give meaning to the specific words in the license? In other words, when we interpret ter template licenses according to this line of cases in the United States, the goal should not be to look at the specific parties to the transaction, to the specific intentions of the licensor and the licensee, but rather to understand how these documents are understood in the community. And once we understand how these documents are understood in the community, then we can go back to this specific transaction, to the licensor and licensee, and we can say, you know, licensor and licensee, we don't really want to look at your specific intentions here, whatever they may be. We're just going to assume that your understanding of this license was basically the way it's understood in the community. And my proposal is to say that we should, when we try and interpret free and open source software licenses, that we should also try and interpret them with this goal in mind. That this is the way. This should be the goal of interpretation for free and open source software licenses. So, going back to the example I gave, I said, if you recall, I gave an example of how we should interpret uh, section 3 of version 2 of the general public license. And the question was, when the la license uses the language plus the scripts to control installation of the executable, does that mean that the, life, that the user of the software actually has to give his users or her users the ability to reinstall the software on any hardware? Does he actually have to allow those users to control the installation of any modified versions of the executable? That is the question. How do we interpret this section in the general public license? And that um, really um, goes back to uh, a specific, in order to understand the interpretation of that, um, the interpretation of that language, we have to go back and we'll take a step back and look at some history. So, um, and, 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 and while this language was from the general public license version 2, we have to understand the history of the, of the drafting of the general public license version 3. So we'll take a few moments to understand that history, and then we'll go back to the language in version 2 and see how it should be understood. So, typoization. That, this is the historical uh, occurrence that led to the drafting of the relevant provisions in version 3 of the general public license. In the 2000s, Tivo, which was a hardware manufacturer, provided in the marketplace DVR devices that had an installed Linux kernel. Linux, as you know, is licensed under version 2 of the general public license. And Tivo devices has a cryptographic hash to check against modified versions of the Linux kernel. So, if 
you had a version of this hardware device and you wanted to reinstall uh, Linux on these hardware devices, Civo would not work on the modified versions of the kernel. You could theoretically take a modified version of the Linux kernel and reinstall it on the hardware, but that would cause the hardware to stop working. In other words, Tivo would provide you with the, mod with the source code of the Linux kernel, which was on the device as required by the general public license. But they did not, they did not provide you with the opportunity to reinstall any modified versions of that Linux software uh, and, and have the hardware continue working. The hardware would cease to work if you modified the Linux kernel in any way. That is what Tivo did. They provided the software, but they did not allow the hardware to continue working if it was reinstalled. And this prompted, this prompted uh, version, uh, a certain provision in version three of the general public license. And that, general, that version of the general public license, previously we had been talking about version two of the general public license, and now we're talking about version three of the general public license. Um, this had an express, version three had an express requirement that the user would have to provide any authorization keys to reinstall the software on the hardware. In other words, while, the, let's go back for a second, in the previous language, in version two of the general public license, it was not completely clear. Or perhaps it did not require that the user provide any installation keys to allow reinstallation of the hardware, of the software on the device. In version three, it was quite explicit that the user had to provide any authorization keys and the graphic hashes in order to allow reinstallation of the device, of the, of the, of the software source code on the device. So the question, as we, th as we talked about, is does the version two of the GPL require the provision of installation information? Does version two, the language that we previously looked at, does it, as version three of the license, does it also require uh, provision of installation information? And this question has been the subject of quite a few recent articles. So on March 25th, uh, Denver Gingrich, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, uh, wrote an article asserting that version 2 historically did require that. There was a response article uh, by McCoy Smith who argued for a number of reasons that version 2 did not require the, the installation of the, uh, the, of, of the installation keys which would allow reinstallation of the source code on the hardware. And then there was a reply by Bradley Kuhn who in another in his blog asserted that no, McCoy Smith was mistaken and Indeed, version two of the license did require uh, users to allow uh, to, to, to allow reinstallation of the software on the hardware. And all of these individuals, all of these individuals, brought to bear certain evidence, certain evidence on their specific preferred interpretation of the license. And I'd like to look at some of the evidence that they brought and see how it fits into the various paradigms of interpretation that we've outlined previously in. This, in, this, in this presentation. So, for example, some of the, infer some of the, of the parties, some of these uh, uh, various themed scholars have looked to the interpretation of the copyright holders, uh, who, of the writers of the Linux kernel. They've said, well, th these writers may have intended um, um, that the GPL mean this. And others have said, no, other copyright holders have not made that in intention. And as we've said, ordinarily, if we're taking an ordinary approach to the interpretation of free and source of software licenses, we would say that the goal of interpretation is indeed to determine the intent of these copyright holders. But as we can see, in the case of free and source, open source software licenses, it often results in confusion because free and source, so open source software projects often have a very large number of copyright holders. And it would be impossible for us to take the account of the intentions of each and every one of the copyright holders. And indeed, they, these intentions may conflict with each other. So it makes no sense for us to say, when we're interpreting these licenses, that we should look to the intentions of the copyright holders. That does not provide uh, a coherent manner for us to come to a, a clear conclusion as to what this license means. 
Other arguments that were raised in the context of this series of articles look to the text of the licenses. And obviously, that's something that needs to be taken account of. So in version two of the general public license, what does scripts mean? Does scripts mean actually that we need to provide authorization keys? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but that is a, that is an, uh, uh, that is a coherent, uh, a valid uh, question that we can look to in trying to interpret the license. And we can also look to a comparison of version two and version three of the licenses. That is also, that is a, a intrinsic, uh, that, that, that this, compar this textual comparison can also shed light on the licenses themselves, what the text in one license says versus the text in the other license. So these are textual arguments, and they obviously um, are valid in the context of discussions regarding interpretation. There are other arguments that these uh, authors bring to bear as well. There are, for example, many of these authors talk about the intent of the original authors of the GPL, uh, the Free Software Foundation of the GPL version 2. What did the Free Software Foundation mean when, uh, when they wrote uh, version 2 of the license? And to some extent, this is obviously connected to the historical understanding of the TiVo episode that we've summarized previously. And these arguments make reference to the statements of the Free Software Foundation during the drafting of the licenses, uh, the statements of Richard Stallman during the drafting of the licenses, and also, uh, though there's less material available about this, the goals of Richard Stallman in drafting version two of the licenses. And the Free Software Foundation and Richard Stallman were, uh, both of them were deeply involved in the drafting of version two and version three of the licenses, and obviously they are to some extent uh, the authors of these licenses. And therefore, uh, in the discussions regarding how version two of the license should be interpreted, um, scholars, the various scholars, make references to how the original authors of the GPL understand, uh, should un understand the language of the license. However, I think that despite the fact that these scholars make references to uh, the intentions of the original authors of version two of the but this is really not uh, how this is really not how uh, an exercise in interpretation of licenses should be directed. As we said, I think that these licenses should be looked at as template agreements, and the intentions of the original authors of these agreements should be less important than uh, what the community, how the community generally understands these licenses. So we can't completely discount. Uh, the original authors of the licenses, but to some extent, I think that when we're looking towards the understanding of the community and the marketplace, that these uh, the intentions of the original authors should have less 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 weight. And then, both uh, all, all three of the authors in, uh, in in the in the in the articles that I referred to earlier make references to community understandings of version two. And here I think that these, are really, these, these understandings are really directed to uh, how we should understand licenses. And these are the most important kind of evidence that we should look to when understanding the licenses. And again, um, these, these auth the authors of the, 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 these articles make references to TiVo's historical action. So TiVo is operating under the general public license version two. What did TiVo do? TiVo, who is a licensee in the community, is obviously acting with some sort of community understanding. What did the community want from TiVo? What did TiVo do? Uh, TiVo's actions, actual actions in the historical context, provide some evidence of what the community thought, how the version two of the license should be interpreted. Um, and again, we should both of these, all three of the of the scholars in the articles I referenced talk about how community actors understood the requirements of version 2 versus version 3 of the general And they talk about how certain community actors, for example, in the Linux kernel, refused to adopt version 3 of the <coughs> version 3 of the general public license because they believed that it included further obligations than were in general the version 2 of the license. And again, this evidence, to some extent, this evidence is the community understanding of how these licenses should be interpreted, which I think is the most important kind of evidence that we should look to in understanding these licenses. Scholars also look to the community drafting process of GPLv3. 
So, um, when the process of in the pro version three of the general public license was not drafted by a single individual, but the community brought to a lot of entities and individuals in the community came together to provide uh, to provide a draft of general public of the general public license. And there were discussions and debates as to what how that language should be and what should be incorporated in that language in the language. And again, I think that these debates, this process of drafting, uh, the community drafting process, gives evidence as to how these licenses should be understood. And I think that is very important evidence because, as I said, when we're looking towards template licenses, uh, the evidence of how the community understood the licenses are very important. And again, um, these authors make references to the frequently asked questions of the Free Software Foundation. Um, and how the Free Software Foundation understood the licenses. And again, to some extent, um, I want to be clear here, that reflects the community understanding. The Free Software Foundation is an author of the license, but it's also a community participant. How the community, and it also affects how the community understands the licenses. So the web pages of the Free Software Foundation um, should also be taken into account as evidence in understanding how this, lang how this language should be interpreted. So, just to sum up, just to sum up, I gave an example in version two of the general public license of some language that is subject to current controversy. I said, at least in my opinion, that while most legal scholars in interpreting that language would generally try to understand the intentions of the parties to the transaction, I said I do not believe that that is really the most coherent way of understanding and interpreting open source software licenses. Rather, we should look to the understanding of the community and understanding those free and software, free and source, open source software licenses. Then um, I gave an example of, of various scholars that have different opinions about how this language should be interpreted. And I tried to categorize the various kind of evidence that they brought in order to, under, to, to give uh, an understanding and interpretation of this language. And I tried to say that uh, some of that evidence is less important some of that evidence is more important towards our goal in understanding how the licenses should be interpreted. Obviously, um, in this short lecture, I'm not going to give my own uh, opinion of what the proper understanding of the licenses is. That's not the goal of this lecture. This goal is just to give some uh, thoughts about how we should approach the question of interpreting the licenses. Anyways. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I hope that in the future I will have the opportunity to meet you all here. And thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. 네, 엘라이 그린범 변호사님의 강연이었습니다. 어, 이번에도 역시 화상 연결을 통해서 질의응답 시간 갖겠습니다. 엘라이 그린범 변호사님께 올라온 질문 중에서 제가 시간 관계상 한 가지만 골라서 질문을 드려보도록 하겠습니다. 먼저 지금 연결해 볼게요. 어, 엘라이 그린범 변호사님, 제 목소리 들리시나요? Can you hear me, Mr. Greenbaum? I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. <웃음> 좋습니다. 그럼 질문 들어가겠습니다. 안녕하세요. 오픈 소스 분쟁은 단순히 저작권의 분쟁이 아니라 최근의 분쟁 사례를 보면 저작권과 계약법에 대한 이슈가 추가되어 복잡화되고 있는 것 같습니다. 미래에는 오픈 소스 분쟁이 어떤 방향으로 흘러갈까요? 라는 질문입니다. So here's the question. Due to time constraint, we ask you just one question. I think open source lawsuits have become more complicated as IP rights and contract act issues have added. What do you think open source lawsuits will be in the future? So I, I agree to some extent that open source licenses have become more complicated um, as uh, as IP rights have become more more complex. Um, for example, I think the GPL version three of the GPL is a more complicated uh, legal document than version two of the GPL. On the other hand, there is uh, some effort to simplify these documents and to come to open source documents that are much simpler and easier to understand. Um, there is an effort uh, right now, for example, to develop a, a copyleft next license, which would be much simpler than the GPL, but essentially, uh, um, perform the same, get, get to the same place as the GPL. Um, 
and I think that these issues of interpretation will be, will, will be uh, important to the extent the documents are complex, and perhaps even more so to the extent these documents become simplified, because obviously simplified documents are shorter, and we have to understand the background and, uh, and, and the intent of the parties, perhaps, um, and the parties to the transactions and the community when, when we read them. So thank you. Thank you for that question. It's a good question. 네, 땡큐. 감사합니다. 여러분들의 심도 깊은 질문 감사드리고요. 어, 또 이어서 어, 이것에 대한 내용을 알려주시겠습니다. 아, 네. 아, 이 질문에 동의합니다. 아, 이 문제들이 특히 오픈소스 분쟁 문제들과 저작권법 관련해서 굉장히 복잡해지고 있습니다. 예를 들어서 GPL 문제도 그렇고 최근에는 윈도우에도 많은 분쟁 문제가 있었습니다. 또 오픈소스 소프트웨어 표준화 문제에도 역시 어, 이러한 분쟁이 있었습니다. 그리고 이런 문제를 해결하기 위한 어, 보이지 않는 노력들이 계속되고 있고 또 GPL에 대한 이 문제들을 좀더 명확하게 하기 위한 그런 노력들도 역시 함께 하고 있습니다. 어, 앞으로 이런 법적 분쟁들은 문서들이 복잡화되면서 더욱 더 어려워질 것으로 예상됩니다. 어, 이 때문에 이러한 배경들과 이 미리 지식들을 어, 이해하고 알고 있는 것이 중요하다고 생각합니다. 감사합니다. 네, 엘라이 그린바운 변호사님의 훌륭한 답변까지 잘 들었습니다. 고맙습니다. Uh, so thank you for your answer and thank you for having your time, Mr. Greenbaum. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.